to really explore like the spiritual dimension. It's a it's, there's a vulnerable part of yourself that you have to uh, experience. If the person is not ready to do that and they don't want to do that, and they say, "No, no, 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 we don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. No, 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 no," you know. Sometimes it's because they're guarding that vulnerability. And so it just, in many cases, it's a matter of time for them to be held in the right kind of way so that they can feel the safety to explore that vulnerability and kind of come to that, oh, wow, that's actually part of this. In this episode of Ayahuasca Podcast, I interview Joe Tefor. Joe is both a medical doctor and a curandero, so he is great at explaining the healing from both, both sides. So we talk about that. We talk about how Ayahuasca work, and uh, both from spiritual perspective, energy perspective, and also from the physical perspective. Uh, we talk about why healing is a state of receptivity. Um, we talk about importance of healthy skepticism, uh, talk about different types of ayahuasca. We compare Colombian ayahuasca with uh, Peruvian ayahuasca. And we also talk about how science and spirituality are slowly becoming to merge. Joe also talks about how psychedelic renaissance is um, leading us as a society to become closer to spirituality. It's a very fascinating, interesting episode, and I'm sure you will enjoy it. Hi, guys, and welcome to ayahuascapodcast.com. As always, with you, host Sam Believe. Today, I'm going to interview Joe Tafour. Uh, Joe Tafour is an author. He wrote the book, A Fellowship of the River. Joe is a medical doctor, speaker, and uh, he's also a curandero. So um, three different people uh, recommended me to interview Joe, and finally, we made it happen. So I'm very excited. Excited, uh, Joe. Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sam. Nice to be here, uh, Joe. Uh, so you, in my opinion, are a perfect person to bridge those two worlds. You know, modern medicine and uh, shamanism. You know, uh, Amazonian shamanism. But before we go into that, uh, can you tell people how did you end up going from being a doctor to being a curandero? Yeah, um, I kind of was, I, uh, in medical school, I got depressed, you know, and I was looking for help. And I was always interested in integrative medicine and alternative medicine. I wanted to be part of that eventually, but I was still, you know, had to go through the training and I ended up going to a peyote ceremony in Arizona um, here at this place called the Peyote Way, which is open to people to, to go and have an experience they call it the Spirit Walk. And I had that experience and um, it was a big deal. You know, it really, really helped me. It really shift, shifted things for me and, and very rapidly. And I just felt like, wow, that was amazing. This kind of plant spirit medicine approach and the ceremonial approach and the link to the kind of the nature and the ancestral traditions. And so I was very curious about that, and I stayed curious about that, and I, I returned to that ceremony a few times um, through the rest of my training, not very many times, a few times over the course of the next few years. And then my family is from, is from Colombia. You know, my parents, all my family is Colombian, and I knew about ayahuasca. I knew my family's not from the jungle, but they knew about it. They heard about it, and I had family friends that were connected to it. And so I knew that that existed and I thought, wow, if this is how peyote works for me. And this is what happens with that. I just had this growing curiosity, you know, to see what was, what's that like. And I knew I wanted to go try it one day. And so I had decided to do that and I waited, I waited till I was done with my training and I had more opportunity. And I met somebody that at the time <clears throat> I went the first time in 2007. And at that time, I don't know, for my family in Colombia, they they were nervous about me as an American going into the Amazon there. It's a little more trouble, a little more problems there. I didn't have any contacts there personally. So I had an opportunity to go to Peru with Shipibos in Peru through people that I knew. 
And I went and I entered ceremony there and I had a huge experience, you know, I had a very big experience and that made me more curious. And I saw what the kind of healing that was happening there at the center. And as a doctor, I was very impressed. And so I started going back, you know, I started going back and then they said, Hey, if you bring a group, you don't have to pay, you know, why don't you bring some people? So I started bringing groups and then eventually become friends with one of the healers, you know, Ricardo Amaringo. And he says, Hey, I want to start my own center. You know, why don't you, why don't you join us? Why don't you help us? And at that time that I was very interested in doing that. And so I wasn't necessarily thinking of going down the path of becoming ayahuasca or curandero. I, I kind of had enough of all my training, you know, with medical and everything. It was just like, okay, I don't really want to go through anything more like that. But then he kind of convinced me and and as part of working there, I went through the training alongside him, you know, and I, and I enjoyed it and I liked it. And uh, I was very uh, fascinated by it. So that's how. Well, I, I, as I listened to you, I realized we have uh, some similarities. Uh, I also, my journey also started with depression and um, I never planned to start a retreat. It kind of happened to me as well. Uh, I guess that's, uh, that's just how it, how it works in this world. Um, so you, you worked with ayahuasca in Peru, right? But I think you, you, you did end up uh, venturing to Colombia eventually. Yes. Yeah, no, I've been working in Colombia as well and running retreats with uh, with my friend and colleague there sochi Pukuru, and sasaima and so she mm-hmm. she trained in the amazon but she's from uh tolima colombia yeah because uh, um you're from colombia but i but i am in colombia and for some reason i want to talk to they assume i know you they're like oh you know you must know joe you must know joe yeah. and uh this is why right. I'm interviewing. So right. my question is, um, a lot of people ask me, you know, in Colombia, ayahuasca is called jahe. It's a, it's a very right. similar, very, very similar medicine, but th- there are very minor differences. Um, ha- have you noticed personally, what is the biggest difference in your opinion between Colombian ayahuasca or jahe, Peruvian ayahuasca? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, uh, it's basically the same plants, you know, so that you're talking about different plants in a different region. So that's going to have a different uh, energy a little bit, you know, being from a different place, just like the people from this place to that place, you know, they're all humans, but they have a different uh, flavor, you know, influenced by the land, the soil, the wind, the sun, you know, like the wine and everything else. So I think it's, I think it's more subtle in the sense that there's some people that would really talk about the big difference or they're very focused on the differences or they're very focused on the substance. But I think that uh, within Colombia, there's going to be a wide range of yahe, you know, from different practitioners, from different preparations, very wide, you know, um, same is true in Peru. And that being said, it's still yahe, it's still ayahuasca made from the plant. So, you know, I think well prepared well um carried through it can be helpful you know i don't know i don't distinguish it so much i think for me sometimes they say they it depends and you t- it depends on who you talk to some colombian yajesero will say it's not uncommon to hear that they say oh the shipibos are adding a lot of chakruna they want more visions they want it to be stronger like that we mm-hmm. prefer it more purgative stronger in the ayahuasca vine you know you hear comments like that but it depends you know i think it really depends and and some of those comments are not coming from like the most wide exposure you know they mm-hmm. maybe maybe they never even met a should people person when they say things like that you know yeah it's interesting that uh, people when they think about shamans or indigenous people for some reason they think they're they're completely saint and they have no emotions. But in reality, I also notice they they tend to be a little bit territorial about those things. They 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 want um, they want to believe that their medicine is the best, which I think is just part of our human nature. Um, what I've heard is that Peruvian ayahuasca lasts a little longer, and Colombian ayahuasca tends to be a little more intense, but lasts a little less. So. I've never tried Peruvian ayahuasca. I heard the, other way. I heard the yeah. other way. I think yeah. the ayahuasca I drink from from my friend from from Sochi in 
that she gets from Colombia and Amazon, I would say a lot of times it lasts longer, you know, mm -hmm. than what I'm drinking in Peru. It depends, you know, I just don't, yeah. I just, I just don't think it's, it's not easy to generalize something like that. Interesting also that you use the, the wine analogy. That's the analogy I like to use. I like to say it's kind of like Cabernet and Sauvignon, you know, it's still red wine. Uh, but, you know, some people might say, you know, it's disrespectful to compare those two things. But yeah, everything, right. everything affects it, the soil, the, the weather. So as a medical doctor, you know, you observe healing with ayahuasca and I know you work with other psychedelics, you know, what, what do you, probably you're one of the better people to explain what is, what is that happens, you know, what, how does ayahuasca healing work? Well, I think that um, it depends, you know, but one of the goals, what I say that the spiritual healing that, you know, the tradition talks about is like an easier way for the Western person to see where that kind of, um, I don't know, sometimes it makes more sense to them is, is emotional healing, you know, that there's a big emotional processing shift that can happen for people. So helping people and then that emotional processing shift, there's also other like uh, Western concepts that you could not, people could relate to like regulating your nervous system, you know, that the person is not as triggered or not as burdened by past conditioning, you know, things that condition them, traumas that condition them, that maybe they didn't serve them to adjust, to adapt to certain kinds of uh, things that they went through. And so then as they come into healthier circumstances or healthier environments, still that stuff from the past is still with them. So it's like clearing and cleaning, you know, the energies of the past and opening yourself up to uh, a more, a new opportunity, you know, a chance to relearn some things that maybe you, you didn't learn so well. Um, it's like a new opening, a new, there's many, the aspects to it, you know, it's, it's very complicated and the possibilities are very wide ranging. So there's some you know, stuff on your brain, there's stuff in your body, there's stuff uh, in your emotional well-being. There's part of it that is spiritual that a lot of people would think of in those terms or describe in those terms. So it depends, you know, it's complicated. It's a big question. I understand that. But uh, for example, uh, medically speaking, most of the active thing, molecules uh, in ayahuasca they're out of your system within 12 hours but sometimes the change stays for you for the lifetime what do you think happens there well something's changing in your body something's rearranging something's reorganizing so you're you're allowing an opening you know let's say like a bigger neural plasticity perhaps an opening for your for your neural networks to reorganize or for different parts of your kind of wiring your patterning within your physical body within your being that that is going to be uh given the opportunity to kind of become plastic again you know what was kind of settled and kind of stuck in a rut or in a routine in a set way gets an opportunity to reorganize and so you know, if the healing is, is good, if the transformation, if there's a transformational healing, then there would be some kind of reorganization within the system, you know, even at the physical level. Yeah, it's, it's painfully difficult to describe ayahuasca healing without uh, using any spiritual terms or talking about um, spiritual side of it. Um, can you now explain it again, but as a curandero? As a curandero, then you're, you're, you know, and the way I talk about it in the, in my books and stuff is just, you know, and with the Western perspective is mixing the two is just, you know, there's an emotional dimension to your well-being, you know, that has energetic implications, you know, there's, that's a way to talk about it. That's what we feel. That's what we experience. And so there's energy that we carry within us, you know, from trauma, from things that we've been through. And so releasing that energy is important. Cleaning and clearing that energy, processing that energy is important to help kind of 
remove blockages, you know, and the, the flow of being within ourselves. And in that same sense, that the spirit can help us to do that, that the spirit, attuning to the spirit, connecting to the spirit um, can open us to a resource you know, that would help someone um, be able to work through and those processes, you know, for example, somebody working through traumas of their early childhood, you know, and being guided by ayahuasca to, you know, go through a healing around what happened to them as a child or go through a healing and, and how they relate to their parents, you know, like that, that context within the spiritual realm, how people would kind of say, oh, that's not real, or oh, they just were they, you know, the challenge is their, their brain. But then emotionally, it was real. You know, the person had a, a significant shift within them, and a felt shift, an energetic shift, that is very real to them. And even though there is a great mystery behind the way some of it happens, still the rubber hits the road at some point. You know, so the mystery, nobody really understands the mystery completely. That's why it's a mystery. So we engage with the mystery. We work with the mystery, but we don't have to be, it doesn't have to be defined, you know, for us to, to be able to uh, draw upon it um, to help. And so as a curandero, like then, you know, different traditions are different. Inga, I'm not familiar so much in Shipibo tradition. It's with master plants, you know, that you train and you learn from the plants of the forest that they're going to help guide the education around how to work with people in ceremony, how to help them, you know, uh, facilitate like healing within their energy being in their energy body, within their emotional body, within their emotional being. And so that is an intuitive process, you know, that's guided through kind of traditional education that again whether people believe it in it or they don't believe in it it's just it doesn't seem to matter actually you know mm -hmm. um and so there's something there there's something mystical so the curandero side is open to the mysterious elements of the of the practice and of the healing i think there is um room for a healthy amount of skepticism because in this um so the new world of new age spirituality, there's a lot of things that I don't think are real, but um, working with ayahuasca for several years, especially observing, you know, thousands of people go through their process. I definitely stretched my skepticism quite a bit and uh, included terms now uh, like energy and things like that, that probably would make me shudder a little bit uh, five years ago or so. But nevertheless, I do believe they're true. I think that, um, you know, it's a complete picture with both spiritual and physical, energetical and physical, and it's uh, hard to explain something with the one side or another. It has to be a complete explanation. Uh, same comes with the way plants themselves um, work on you. You know, part of ayahuasca healing is physical purge and it can be explained. Another part is, is very spiritual. What What are your thoughts on uh, the effort by a medical establishment now to sort of separate the those medicines, um, the spiritual part part of it from the physical part of it, and just kind of make a molecule that tries to fix you but take away the spiritual side of it. Yeah, I mean it's it's not a very impressive approach, you know. So like you said, you know, you came with your mentality and your ideas and your skepticism, which is good. You know, the, the wise skepticism, you want to be skeptical. It's, it's intelligent to be careful, but then you're there and you observe and you get more involved and you see the results, you know, and you see the benefit of incorporating these other elements into what's being done with those people, you know, at your center. It's not being done to... I don't know, for the benefit of the healers, just to say, because they believe in it and they like to hear themselves talk about things like that. You know, they, they could, they could be sure they can be extra superstitious. You can bring elements to it that maybe aren't as, as crucial or important, but still there's, you're saying it yourself, like you've been there for a few years and you say, whoa, if you can't leave this part completely out of it. So then they of course come 
to the pick to the party the way you you know i mean without just saying that's how they're showing up you know uh basically you could say inexperienced and so they come with their whatever mechanical model of the world and you know basically uh sometimes an arrogance you know with with that energy and in general a lot of times what you see and maybe you've seen this there at your center that that rigid kind of uh mental framework a lot of times is is uh protecting you know kind of a an emotional vulnerability you know the to really to really explore like the spiritual dimension it's a it's, there's a vulnerable part of yourself that you have to uh experience you know that's that's true and so if the person is not ready to do that and they don't want to do that and they say no 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 we don't have to do that you don't have to do that no 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 you know sometimes it's because they're guarding that vulnerability and so it just in many cases it's a matter of time for them to be held in the right kind of way so that they can feel the safety to explore that vulnerability and kind of come to that oh wow that's actually part of this so i mean we have to have compassion for that perspective i don't know how threatening that perspective is you know to the actual the practice because so far all they have is like a lot of talk you know they don't have anything to back up what they're saying they're just telling people oh shouldn't it be like this how come it's not like this we should be able to do it just with the molecules okay you know go ahead like oh, you know what's stopping you and so i think that that it kind of remains to be seen and so i think there's a little funky thing where there's a there's an arrogance in the air from that side that's making it sound like it's so convincing where they're coming from but i think if we really look at the evidence it's like okay there's there's room for healthy skepticism over what they're saying if we're honestly skeptical well then we should be skeptical of that like you where is this that you're talking about that you know how to do this you know are the people flying from all over the world to go out to the jungle to 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 meet you to find to to receive from what you're giving them or is it just like a laboratory idea on a white paper to raise investment is that what it is because if it, probably that's what it is because i don't see all the people going to so far they may become more i'm open to the idea that it could be m- much more but i think we should we can be skeptical that so far mm-hmm. we're still waiting to hear you know what they have to say I like- I like something you said in the other podcast that they've tried it before to separate the medicine from the spirituality and what they ended up with was the antidepressants and we all know right. how it, how it works or it doesn't work. Right. Yeah. I mean that's and that's what that's like and so why did they come up with antidepressants or what yeah it's a it's a it's a business concept. You know. They're not it's if you're selling an idea a business idea sure you know you want to talk it up and say hey i think we can do this and i think we can do that mm-hmm. but that may not be the case you know it might be a flop if it's just a business idea if it's not rooted in actual practical experience with medicine and healing then it might just be a flop you know like a new any other new business idea yeah it can actually it can also be hurt for long term like uh some antidepressants unfortunately are i mean they they're a good tool for a lot of people in in uh, desperate situations but they don't seem to get rid of the um, at the core of the of the issue um and they, regarding... you're right, and they can do damage over time some of those medications you know really prolonged use it, it can be damaging to the system so yeah maybe they will figure out a way to put a shaman in a pill as well and you take um take two pills <laughs> somehow Yeah it's sure. uh, you know what you talk about skepticism and science you know science is observation right if you observe something and it keeps repeating then you can create science right you do studies about it so if you come to this world of ayahuasca and you observe people getting over a depression over and over again then you believing in it doesn't mean you're just believing it out of faith you know you you actually have your own little science you know end of one and you know that it works or if it worked for you personally it worked for me personally 
so so you get to believe in it so i guess that's uh that's just normal right it's observation and so then you and then being down there and living there with those people you realize oh well they're observing it too like just because they're not from my culture doesn't mean that they're idiots you know it's like guess what they're speaking from their observation you know, they're not just saying it, trying to convince you to believe in whatever they're talking about, you know? And so that that skepticism is is like, can be as part of the openness is like, okay, well, let's listen to somebody. Let's get to know who we're talking to, you know, before we just say, oh, they're just savages. They don't believe, they, we, they, they don't believe in, you know, the mm -hmm. truth. Yeah. Speaking of science and spirituality, I think you spoke about it as well, where uh, inevitably they, they, they meet each other when, for example, when we go to like quantum physics. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think that they're, they're just, it's back to what we were saying about observation, you know, that there's an element of spiritual practice and that's coming out of observation you know thousands of years of observation there are sure there's layers of ignorance that can be put on top of that but some of it is actual study you know people studying hindu you know uh, philosophers studying you know meditation you know or people all over the world to their spiritual study observing this is how what we see. This is what we think. This is how the world works. Like there is that projection. Sure, there's room for that projection, but there's also the observation is still there. Similarly, the science is, yeah, it's it's observing, you know, it's observing for sure. But then you see, you you witnessed it yourself, how the the prejudices that that uh the politics that would govern, you know, even such a, a field where it's always oh, just simple observation. But as observation where we don't we don't allow those people's observations to be part of the system. Only these observations, you know, and so then you see, oh, well, there's some arbitrary uh, distinctions here. So then science becomes a belief system at some point. You know, obviously, this, the evidence based part of it is, is important and we're all learning from that. There's a universal knowledge growing from that investigation and that research, which is very powerful. And there's a belief system, you know, where the person becomes a fundamentalist, where they start believing in parts of it without proof. You know, the guy tells you, oh, we can do this. Don't worry, we'll figure it out. You know, there's no proof, but he says, oh, well, well because science is going to figure it out. So then when you're seeing somebody describe their faith to you, you know, like they, they feel their proof is that they believe in it. So then they criticize the other person for having faith. But at some point, their knowledge does hit a leap of faith point that many of them take. I believe, you know, whatever. This is what happens to you when you die. I believe this. I believe that. I believe that that spiritual healing, that emotional healing that you're doing in the Amazon is not useful. You know, that's a belief. It's not necessarily an evidence-based point of view. So there's a lot of crossover, you know, there's observation on both sides, there's belief systems on both sides. So the skepticism is important on both sides, but also the honest observation. And, and uh, so I think that science is um, spirituality. One of the big differences, spirituality is, kind of a more holistic perspective that doesn't, um, that allows for there to be some kind of meaningfulness to things. Science can have that, but science, some people use science to try to say that there is no meaning. You know, they try to use the evidence to support that, that there's no purpose, there's no meaning, it's just empty, nihilistic. You know, the, the materialism that they focus on so where is that coming from? What is that? We know there are some arbitrary observations there. We know there are some things that you're not talking about. And so again, for me, in my experience, I do see that sometimes the overly rigid, overly, you can have the new age, you can have people who are out ungrounded, unrealistic. Sure, that exists. But then on the other side, 
you can have the closed like hearted and it's a lie you know it is a lie that it doesn't bother them it is a lie that it doesn't affect their relationships that it doesn't impact the way they relate to their families the way they relate to the world to nature yes it does affect those things you know mm -hmm. that is an observed uh, fact well if you can choose what you believe i think um if you can believe that when you die your soul gets goes somewhere and your existence continues or you can believe that when you die you just uh, lights off and you disappear i think you should just choose it's better to choose to believe the the first option because it's uh, it's more optimistic i think it would affect the way you live your life as well but um what i was trying to say as well is uh, more, very very cutting edge science with all the numerous dimensions and uh, parallel universes and string theories and quantum physics the, it doesn't it doesn't it's not really that far from from the from the spiritual spiritual way of thinking and you know believing in in in, in things that don't seem to be real you know it's it's um they kind of start to come together when you look into that no that's true that's true there's uh there's you know the science as if you follow the logic and the science all the way into the subatomic space for example you know then you get into this quantum physics and you get into this mysterious uh reality you know that there's a there's possibilities and and that things don't uh that there's dimensions like you mentioned beyond what we're familiar with or whether what our senses are regularly attuned to and so there's just much more to the picture and that that is clear from what the science is actually producing so you know why are, and i guess that's going to take a stronger and stronger um make a stronger influence i would imagine over time you know they that some of the quantum physical properties of matter one of the things i came across was that there's like quantum entanglement which is considered like kind of a weird you know a uh, uh, property of, of matter of 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 light of, of whatever the, the universe that for example certain subatomic particles and photons can be entangled with one another and then that means that they're going to be connected and so somehow the state of one will inform the state of the other or they could learn the state of one from the state of the other and that that could happen across distances that would indicate that it's happening instantaneous faster than the speed of light that is transcendent that it's as far as we know it's happening instantaneously across space time that this is now something proven that this exists that was, was the mathematics had indicated the possibility of that in einstein's time and then in the last several decades, they they discovered that this is a real phenomenon. And now quantum entanglement and that those elements of, of the quantum physics are my understanding. I'm not an expert of this, but that they are utilized somehow in the functioning of quantum processors. And that the quantum processors are part of what is allowing the processing speeds to go into these new you know, orders of magnitude that are allowing for things like artificial intelligence like that that is maybe related to the quantum entanglement you know that the mysterious um nature of matter the mysterious nature of i don't know this energy is uh currently being utilized uh mm -hmm. in many different ways um and you know burning up as it turns out this uh artificial whatever intelligence is going to you know burning up a lot of energy you know it's like it's not just nothing it's not just another computer program it's like it's burning up a lot of energy it's something very significant that they're tapping into to try to make all this stuff happen yeah, another quantum experiment the, the double slit experiment that's very very famous but where the presence or the absence of the observer defines whether what the shootout becomes a particle or a wave which kind of means you know sp spiritually speaking your your thought or your prayer can affect the nature of the matter which is also scientifically proven so it kind of 
explains to you know people pray for things or as uh, they say now manifest and it can you can kind of try and see and trace it to to some kind of science so yeah this yeah. is all very very fascinating uh speaking of science have you come across any uh, particular studies on on ayahuasca that maybe you you love to share about or psychedelics in general any favorite yeah. studies when it comes to ayahuasca i mean there's i think my i like the studies that are studying the traditional um setting so there's there's some and they're like including you're in colombia you know there's some inga uh, I can't remember his name, but he speaks at a lot of the conferences. Um, and there's another lady, Tucano, from Brazil, and I was part of a panel. And some of the Amazonians have asked that they don't do clinical research on ayahuasca, you know, that they feel like that will be a pathway toward commercializing it, that that will just simply try to make a product and forget about the tradition and forget about the people forget about the people that taught them how to do it and the plants and everything. So they were asking people to not pursue that, you know? And, and so I, I respect that. I understand that. And so I like here in America, for example, our work with ayahuasca is being, is not being done through clinical research, but through religious protection. Then we're saying, okay, we're the spiritual practice of working with the medicine is what we want to protect. That being said, there have been a few studies uh, of ayahuasca within a Shipibo context at the Temple of the Way of Light. It's, they published a couple of research studies. Um, one of them was on grief, like the loss of a loved one, people coming for help with grief over someone in their, you know, a loved one that died. And they found significant results from there. Like it's a 12 day program and they did one year follow up and the, 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 this it stayed, you know, this, the shift stayed with the person and it wasn't not like, like in a strong majority. So it was a significant, uh, um, study and it showed significant results. They subsequently were trying to explore like, okay, what about working with Westerners with your people medicine? You know, how, how does that impact them? And they found, yes, it was very impactful. So around this cultural ideas or these cultural limitations, at least in that setting, they weren't running into that. That wasn't blocking what was happening with people. And they found that they had really significant shifts in people's sense of personal well-being and spiritual well-being. You know, uh, one of the things they mentioned in one of those studies I thought was very interesting was the, the, the idea of the presence of the healer. You know, so then as we get into the tradition, we say, okay, the ayahuasca or the yaje or the molecules, you know, that that's a component of what's going on for people, but there's the ceremony and the setting and the retreat and the community and all these other elements that are there. And then you have these advanced practitioners, you know, that are coming from traditions where they study how to work with the ceremony and they study in a multi-generational kind of wisdom, you know, uh, practice where you could imagine they could get very advanced uh, knowledge about how to work with those settings. And so they could probably do things maybe that you never even heard of or saw before, like no one you know, you know, has any idea about what they're doing. Just like if you took one of them and you brought them to, I don't know where, you know, to Austria and said, hey, let's make a violin today. You know, sit down, come on here, watch this guy. He's making the violin. Just let's do what he does. You know, it's like something like that. And so in that study, the one of the results was they showed that something like 36% of the people that received the healing said that the healer was the most significant part of their uh, journey more than the ayahuasca. So I thought that was interesting. You know, when you see these multifactorial things, the other people say, oh, it's just the molecule. But then meanwhile, the evidence is like, oh, you know, that's not what we're seeing here from the observation. Yeah, I think the the healer is a big part of it, but also the group. I've uh, yeah, I've been recently I've been noticing that, you know, group uh, and and the support of people, especially if you create a container that of uh, mutual support, the group tends to play a role. You know, almost similar on on the 
you know, important to, to ayahuasca itself. I, I definitely can attest to that. Um, I like that you mentioned uh, this violin analogy. That that brings me to to one question that I wanted to ask you. Uh, you went and you try and you worked with Chipibos and you trained to be a curandero. W what are your thoughts on um, a lot of people that discover ayahuasca and after a few ceremonies they start uh, believing that you know maybe they might be a shaman or trying to get an express course on how to give ayahuasca. Uh, obviously, my opinion is that it's possible, but needs to be done respectfully and with a lot of time. And this violin analogy that he uses is, is very beautiful. You know, you come, if somebody from a jungle comes to Austria and wants to make violin, they will have to accept the reality that it's difficult and you need to train for years till you get a good violin. But for some reason, some people come and they think, you know, ayahuasca is just giving the cup and it's very easy and they can do it uh, basically starting tomorrow. So what would you tell those people? Yeah, it's like, you know, if they're very serious about it, they would want to learn more. You know, I can understand there's an enthusiasm and they want to participate and they want to get involved, but, but it's not that serious. You know, to be honest, you know, it's like if you go, if the Shipibo goes to Austria and he says, yeah, you know, here, I can do it in a month. And then it's like, okay, now we take his violin and we take it to the symphony. You know, we say, okay, we're going to have the violin solo, play the, the violin from that person. And it's like, so no one's going to be surprised if it's like, wow, there's a lot of room for improvement there, you know? And so if you're serious about it, if you want to just make a violin like that, and that's that's how that's you know, they're probably I don't think they're ever gonna let it in the symphony again, you know, when that one. That's that's okay, you know, but you can keep doing that. But if you want to take it further, sure, there's a lot more to learn, you know. That's number one. And so a lot of people aren't very serious about it, you know, because to be serious about it is to be dedicated for years. Because, like you said, that's what it is to make the violin like that, it takes years. So they, you know, they're kind of in a, you could say it's like a fad, you know, they're, they're just, they're, they're interested. They're, it's like, they're taken by it. They're really interested, but to really evolve and become like a, uh, the kind of practitioner that, that with the tradition or people would say, oh, that's, that person is well experienced. You know, they're, they're safe. They, they can handle a lot of different situations, not because they think they can, but because they already did it. You know, I'm a doctor. It's like they don't let you out of medical school because you think you can do that surgery or this surgery. You have to do it in front of somebody else like many times before they like check the box. OK. That's how you learn in an apprenticeship. You know, that's the traditional way that it's like you don't get to do it because you think you can do it. You have to actually have somebody who knows how to do it and knows how to do it means they did it before. Like they just did it last week in front of everyone, you know? So then that's like, it's a known thing that they were able to help that person. And so they feel confident that they can help this person. And they feel confident to see, to, uh, to evaluate where are you at in your progress? You know? So I think it's, it's about patience. And I respect that the passion that people have for something like that. But if they're really serious about it, then, hey, they'd want to make a good violin, I would think. And if they just want to, like, kind of check it out for a while and mess around and kind of live a lifestyle or maybe become the center of attention for for a group of people, I don't know, all the different reasons that people might, like, rush into that kind of thing. Or maybe they really see a big need, you know, that could be from that place. They see this need is so intense. They want to help so bad. Um but all the more reason to be careful and to learn more and to study harder, to try to, to go. And so I think the patients, all the traditions teach that. So then why would you think that you're the one? And so then we say, the, this is a Colombian, you know, Taita. He said, if the medicine is making you feel, so we know that the medicine can confuse people. We know that. 
we know that the medicine can fill people's egos and kind of really strengthen their narcissism or all just confusion. It, it have we see it, it happens, it's common. So then so then how do you discern? You know, how do you know? Like, hey, is it really telling me I'm the one, I'm the chosen one? And so it's just like, well, he says, if the medicine is telling you that you're more special than everybody else or that you're different from everybody else, then it's not working. It should be make it should help you understand how you are integral to the whole. That's the sign that you're learning. That's very wise. And um, the analogy I like to use is, of course, there can be a signal and um, a desire and calling to be a shaman or a curandero or ayahuasquero. Uh, but some people confuse the invitation letter to the university with a diploma. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that's, then, a good, uh, that's a good one right there. I like that one. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I do like I do come up with good analogies sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> the what they what you said about violin, yeah, they can make a violin, but then at least uh, even if it might ruin a concert, but it's not going to ruin somebody's life. And I see a shaman right. as a um, neurosurgeon for your soul. So if if he's a neurosurgeon for your soul, let's say it takes fifteen years to become a neurosurgeon, and somebody can take a scalpel and they can mimic the work of a neurosurgeon, but it doesn't mean they're actually doing it well so um yeah. um let's move on uh, from that topic it's uh it's a painful one so i guess uh, uh, i want to talk about it but uh let's talk more about the healing um you talk about uh, healing as a state of receptivity can you talk a little bit about that yeah that was from a colombian healer sochi bukuru over there in sasaima not far from you uh sochi says that line you know, that's something that she she maybe heard it from somewhere. I don't know. But she, she says that she says healing is a state of receptivity and healing is a state of consciousness. And so there's this idea that you the reason to be open to the spirituality or the mystery or just those parts that we don't completely understand, but somehow are there the quantum physics, whatever it is. Is because there's some kind of source there for us to draw from, you know, that there's there. The healing happens when the person is open to this kind of, you know, it's ha in, the, in the psychedelic research and the MDMA research in the United States, they have come up with this idea, this innate healing intelligence that the, the therapist is trying to help the person come into their innate healing intelligence, that there's something innate, that there's something uh, fundamental to being that is nourishing and um, healing, that a big part of, of helping people is trying to help them get past all the conditioning or the ideas of all the reasons why they are not connected to that, that they're not good enough to be part of that, that if there is something sacred or if there is something quantum physical about themselves, then helping them to open that in themselves, to open that connection, that connectedness, and so that state of receptivity is being able to be open without to, to, to receiving, you know, let's say like the blessing to receive yourself. And so then there's another element to that I'm just learning about now. It's, I don't, I haven't read that paper, but I heard about it that one of the new research kind of analyses of the MDMA research is saying that the, one of the main things that they observe is the self-compassion that helping people find self-compassion. So there's an acceptance, you know, in the receptivity of self, of the world, of being that somehow puts you into a connection to an inspiring energy. You know, there's something to that. 
here in Arizona, the Navajo, the Diné people, they say, walk in beauty. You know, if you walk in beauty, then in that kind of consciousness, and I think that there's a lot of gurus and people that talk about the same kind of thing, that they're trying to align their consciousness and their bodies to be able to receive the, the spiritual awareness that is a consciousness that reflects a healthy functioning of the body. You know, that the more harmonious it is with its environment, with its ecosystem, the more evidence that the biology that you see is that's more resilient. So that, that resilience from that biology, where is that coming from? You know, you say this, this mind state or this openness. So this idea is that maybe there is a metaphysical energy that you're tuning into. That is not just a positive attitude, but more an alignment. Yeah, that's beautiful. Walk, walk in beauty. That's uh, something I'll try to do tomorrow <laughs> when I'm walking. Uh, Joe, I, I know you're writing a new book or maybe you're finishing already. Can you talk, talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm trying to write a new book. I'm still writing it, but I'm towards the end, the last part. And it's about kind of what I was just talking about in a way, but what it's about is uh, it's about um, how the psychedelic renaissance and as a doctor in the research world, clinical world up here, is reopening an interest in spirituality. And similarly, the people that are through their search for healing, that go to the Amazon and go to these other cultures because of their suffering, you know, they go to seek healing and that healing kind of turns them on to this spiritual dimension that, oh, wow, what I needed was somehow to reconnect to that. And when I allowed myself to reconnect to that, then, you know, my mental health started getting better. And so this idea that the psychedelic renaissance is reopening an interest in spirituality from a health driven perspective that is that can be skeptical, that's that should be skeptical, that we embrace the skepticism of it. But as we embrace that skepticism, then we follow the research. You know, we follow the research and the research is showing that, yeah, um, helping people connect to meaning and purpose in their lives uh, and a sense of sacredness is making a big difference in their emotional health and their physical health and in their mental health. And that that's what the traditions have taught. And so I use the last 30 years of the clinical research, the Renaissance and psychedelics as a framework of stories that so I touch on the research and the science and things that we just talked about, quantum physics, things that came up in the last 30 years, including the internet, you know, all these things that have been popping up in this very interesting times in which we live and showing just stories from my own spiritual path during that time that were like my, that made me kind of take more as have another spiritual step. Like, oh, I was living this life and then this made me want to do that. And then this, and then this, and then eventually, you know, be part of a spiritual community in the United States that's asking for legal protection for ayahuasca to honor the ancestral tradition, you know, because it's this dignity that you're talking about where the healer that you see that is doing so much good, but then they don't realize he's making a beautiful violin. You know, they think it's just whatever stones and twigs, you know, so they don't see what it is. So as we see that again and honor that again, then we're going to learn about how we've disconnected from nature uh, so dramatically, you know, and how that's connected to a disconnection from ourself. And so as we bridge science and spirituality again, that personal healing 
has the opportunity to help open our healing in our relationship with the ecosystem, you know, but we can't discount the matters of the heart. We can't discount the mystical or the quantum physical, like we have to address it, you know, just because you don't want to talk about it doesn't mean it's going to go away. And if it's making you sick to ignore it, then now it's an economic problem. You know, if that, if that registers for people, you know, now you're wasting your money. So it's exploring those topics, but it's really a series of stories is the goal. It's a great topic. Uh, I'm, I think about that a lot personally, and I've been thinking about it just a few days ago. I think that, uh, for me personally, I was never a spiritual person and I'm afraid to admit I am a spiritual person now and psychedelics Mm -hmm. brought me into it. Uh, and, But it's a, but we're talking about a universal spirituality, you know, in other words, not that, not the foolishness, yeah. but the, what you're, what you see, you know, the, the, where the rubber hits the road. And so in the, in the tradition, the ancestral tradition in the Inga, I'm sure, and the Shipibo and the Navajo in the Americas and in many other parts of the world, spirituality and health are considered the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because if you're connected, as you say, and you have the connection to the source and your your body is balanced, it will heal itself. And um, so I I think about it a lot and like coming back into spirituality and how psychedelics can help. Of course, um, I kind of look at it this way, you know, at at La Huayra, our motto is connect, heal, grow. Yeah. Which kind of nicely describes it all. You, You connect, then you heal. And then you grow and the growth is is also spiritual growth where you start to understand more and it takes a lifetime and you never you're never over um but i think that i understand from seeing people you know there can be people that in our culture that they think getting rich is what's going to make them happy or fulfilled or as they say here in colombia pleno you know you're you're full mm-hmm. you, you don't you don't need anything else Right. And um, and it doesn't do it. So in the end, I think spirituality is inevitable. You have to go to spirituality because it is the final step. And 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 I realized that when I interviewed Kyle Buller, uh, a co-host of Psychedelics Today, a yeah. few weeks ago, and he had the near-death experience. And then after surviving, he had psychedelic experience, including ayahuasca experience and mushroom experience. And he says it's a very similar state of consciousness. So, so inevitably... Uh, maybe then when you die, you will be spiritual anyway. Uh, so yeah. you, you go well, back to the spirit, a lot of, a lot of people whether, <laughs> whether you're spiritual or not. So it's kind of like, uh, in reality, everyone is spiritual because that's that's what we are. You know, we have a soul. Yeah. And whether you accept it or not, it's kind of like, um, what's the analogy? You know, well, I'm probably going to offend somebody with this one. But if you're, uh, let's say if you're, if you're white and you say you're Asian, you can you can accept it, but in reality you, you're still white. And and I guess, yeah, I'm probably gonna offend somebody with this one, but uh, yeah, no, please. but it's back to that. It's this, it's this like you said, like there's just there's a there's a truth, there's a denial, you know. If you're if your if your system is built on a denial, that's still that's gonna cause a problem for you somewhere, you know. You're gonna go and. You know, to the old Asian grandma, and she's going to say, no, you're white. You know, I don't care mm-hmm. what you tell me. You know, yeah. it's, it's going to come up because like there's that, something there. Like the naked king uh, uh, fairy tale, you know, the kid will say you're, you're naked because he doesn't have um, yeah. that process built into him to lie. Um, Joe, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It was a very interesting conversation. Um where where can people find more about you? Yeah, thanks for having me, Sam. Very nice to talk to you. Uh, people can find more about me on drjoetofor.com and also on modernspirit.org. That's so they can find me there. Great. And I wish you best of luck with your book. And I want to say this, right in beauty. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Joe. Beautiful. I wish you all many blessings on your work down there. One day, maybe I'll go to La Waida.
definitely come over. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you like our podcast and would like to support us and Psychedelic Revolution at large, please follow us and leave a like whenever you're listening to this podcast. Nothing in this podcast is medical advice. It's intended for educational purposes only. Limpia, limpia.